Yes. Hello and welcome to this segment of VidMag Television. We're here with Trent Reznor from Nine Inch Nails. Let's say hi, Trent. Hi, everybody. It's taken a long time to get this interview. We're pretty excited about doing it because this is a band that, for those of you who don't know, um, have gone a very long way in a very short space of time. Well, why don't you tell us how you got it started, Trent? Um, just kind of hung out in my room and wrote some songs, and then at the same time I was working in the studio here in Cleveland. And um, this was the beginning of 88, and during the course of that year, the first six months of that year, kind of came up with the idea for Nine Inch Nails and uh, sent some tapes out, got a record deal and by the end of that year and then 89 I spent the first half, well the first three or four months writing the record and then recording it which takes us to summer then I got a band together to play out live which takes us to late fall then we started playing out in January and I've, we've been playing out on the road since end of January until now being beginning of August Okay, and basically then, um, you know, you were working at Right Track Studio, right? Yeah. And you were doing some engineering work there, and um, Bart, who's the owner of the studio, let you play around in your own time. Did you have any prior experience with the equipment that you had there, or did you teach yourself everything that you learned while you were there? Uh, with keyboard stuff, I knew what I was doing, but with um, engineering, mixing, that type of stuff, I was kind of a rudimentary knowledge, but I taught myself engineering, kind of, so... Not that I'm a great engineer, but I know my way around a bit now. Mm -hmm. Did you have any um, intentions of like doing all your own work on the album, or did you plan from the beginning to go out and look for other people? At first I wanted to get a band, but I couldn't find anybody that I could work with uh, that wasn't just wasting time and going back and forth. So I, after whining about not finding anybody for a long time, I just decided to do it. And after getting started and having the discipline to do that, then it got to be fun, and then it was rewarding. So, then it, I liked working by myself, and I think I'll do the next record the same way, pretty much. So basically, then the first record, I mean, well, the first record was entirely yourself. You played all the instruments and everything, right? Right, right. The only collaboration, really, was um, with the producers that worked on it. Why don't you tell us a little bit about that? The, uh, you had four people, basically, that were involved in the production and mix down and remixes of the album, and they're all pretty, um, infamous, I guess you could say, in their own right. Yeah, um, it was cool working with all of them. I learned quite a bit, um, stealing ideas from also how they work, and I um, wasn't really disappointed with any of them. It was a nice learning experience for me, benefited the record. Um, it was surprisingly easy to get them involved. I just sent them a tape, and they called back and said, hey, let's do it. Then it's just a matter of budgeting and um, scheduling if you can afford it or if you can fit it in their schedule. And the, the tapes, um, as I recall, kind of traveled a long distance, didn't they? Like back, be, back and forth between Cleveland and other places? Yeah, we, most of the basic tracks we did in London, which I was wanting to go to London just to do it, and it was fun. And then the rest of it was, some of it was mixed in, uh, some of the basic tracks were in Cleveland, and some of the mixing was in New York. So I figure if I can get a free trip out of it, you know, why not? <laughs> Right, hey, I don't blame you. Um, now, Nine Inch Nails music is basically kind of like in the forefront of what's almost a brand new musical style. Um, did you do this intentionally, or I mean, obviously you had had influences from some of the people that you had worked with on in the production, but were you like aware of the fact that you were breaking new ground at the time you were doing it? I don't think this is really breaking new ground. I think it's um, or in English ground. Um, I think it's introducing a few elements into certain genres that you don't normally hear, like lyric matter. And some of the lyrics in this stuff, I don't think that's what you normally hear with uh, more aggressive industrial synth type stuff. Um, I don't think I've done anything amazingly new. I think what I've done is make a record that is more accessible than one might think at first. Um, I don't know why that is. I just, and I've thought a lot about it. But I just tried to make an album that had some depth to it, that incorporated things I liked from groups I'd like growing up or records I'd really liked. Um, so I think it's just, I mean, what I look to hope to do in the future, rather than say, here's this new form of music, it's nothing more to me, or what I'm looking to do, since I'm not making any sense now, is 
put things together that don't normally go together to make potentially a new thing, but comprised of very distinct. You know, to me, the record sounds like there's a definite tip of the hat to the ministry kind of industrialness. Um, more sensitive lyrics, curish, the the ish type lyrical approach, um, stuff like that. I've got some new ideas that I want to throw together and see what comes out. It might just be a load of crap, but it might be all right. You know? <laughs> well, you never know until you try, right? Actually, you started to, to move into the area of the next question I was going to ask, because the songs that you do write about, um, for the most part, a lot of the topics have already been done by these other groups, as you mentioned, but um, your approach is different to them. Um, are, do they come from like personal experience or like just things that you see around you, or how do you write the songs? Uh, you know, when I started doing it, I didn't want to put out like a macho man rock tough album so much as just, and I have no real worldly political beliefs. I'm not really interested in changing the world per se. So I just concentrate on what I could speak about with authority, which is how I felt about certain things. So it just turned into being a very introspective, kind of small scale personal record. And I just wrote about what was bothering me and what was in my head, you know. The I in the songs is me, so it's like, I don't know. And it's not all, I mean, people start thinking, uh, you have terrible love life or horrible traumatic childhood. It's like, no, I just, I feel certain ways about certain things. You know? I don't know. Well, it's it's something I also understand that uh, you've had a lot of people over periods of time coming up to you and saying, did you write that song about me? Because you know people can relate. It becomes a personal album or whatever to to most people that listen to it because it's it it deals with a topic that we all deal with and in a way I guess that literally does come you know home to everybody and the people when you listen to it can feel like it's themselves too. That's I mean when I said out to do if someone can relate to it or uh, hey man I just whatever and it's really a list of record and it made me feel good or maybe you know mad or whatever that's all I was hoping to do is there's a few records when I grew up that I would do that for me and I was kind of was hoping to kind of aim at that market you know or aim for that person you know yeah. it's not for everybody definitely but right I think you've had a fair, fair good fair deal of success with that um, Regarding your videos, um, you've got two, uh, Head Like a Hole, which is the new one, and Down in It, which was the first one. Um, how do you go about doing a video? Does the band have any input in what actually gets done, or, I mean, is this your script, or does the video company pretty much control all that? Um, I mean, I could pick who I wanted to work with video-wise. I can't do video, so I had to farm it out to somebody else director-wise. So uh, the guys I chose did both the two videos we have done now. They did both those, and they're filming a live show, actually tonight show in Cleveland, mm -hmm. for part of a tape we're going to put out to sell later. Anyway, uh, they're called H Gun. They're from Chicago. Um, I liked them because they did Stigmata, which I thought was a great video. Very anti-MTV. I hate MTV. I hate the videos that are on MTV. And someone said, name your favorite five videos, and I, I can't name two that I think are good. You know? um, the ones I do like are ones that are uncommon or they're not a commercial for the music. You know? mm -hmm. But when you try to talk a record label into spending X amount of thousands of dollars, which is quite a bit, for a piece of art that the main outlet for that art won't show it, like MTV, if there's anything remotely different or unusual or maybe disturbing, then you, you can't, mm -hmm. you won't make it. It's got to be mindless and dumb and look like all the rest of them and promote the product, which is the music. So, anyway, um, the first video down in it, I set up the guidelines of a, I didn't want it to be a lip sync video. I didn't want it to be a literal interpretation of all my lyrics um, and just abstract and not really show the band very much. And we toyed around with the idea, they introduced the idea of it being about suicide, which is not what the song was about really, as far as I can tell. And um, we did it, and I, I thought it was all right for what we did at the time. Uh, I had like a whole, I had a very in detailed um, treatment for what the video should be like. And I talked to H Gun again, and we kind of mutated that into what it is now, which is basically the elements that I wanted to incorporate in the video. Um, some live performance, um, and a kind of playing up the ritual aspect of, um, the music was based on 
a couple tr Aborigine tribal loops I got in somewhere. And just to kind of get this thing to where like almost our performance turns into a strange ritual-like thing. And it came out about 80% of what I'd originally thought. Mm -hmm. Things change as you do them, and I always keep it open so they can do that. And we're doing a new one now for Sin, which will not be on MTV. I can 100% guarantee that. <laughs> so it'll be on our tape that we put out, though. Mm -hmm. So and clubs will have it if they dare play it. But it's going right. to be pretty. Well, well, too. That's what shows like Vidmag are there for as well, is to give outlets that you know this other is pretty places strong want stuff. To so it'll be a good test to see how open any station really is. Well. If I'll tell you, if, if the cable company doesn't say anything about it, and they usually don't for things, and it's just a couple of minor little things that they that they you know won't let go through, but you know, we shouldn't have any problems with it. Um, now this is a band, as I as I mentioned when we first started the interview, that's come a very long way in a very short space of time. Um, you had your first show last November um, at the um, CMJ as this form of the band. Um, since then, you've gone on tour with um, Peter Murphy, which is the last tour, and the one immediately before that was opening for Jesus and Mary Chain. And that seems to be fairly unprecedented for uh, a new band of, you know, like your nature. And uh, how does that affect what you do and how you do it? Being big is a record deal, and it's mm -hmm. usually not playing out six nights a week at the local club so you can meet girls, you know. So. Abstain a while, then you can go on tour and, you know, mm -hmm. destroy your mind like I <laughs> And have the world beat a path to your doorway. So, well, uh, I want to thank you very much for this interview. Um, as I said, you know, we've waited a long time for it and... Uh,